Today, I have Kirsten Withrow from the Crisis Center. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, Kirsten is, the, is a, a mental health education coordinator over there. Um, and I was hoping that you could tell us a little bit more about the Crisis Center and when it was established and uh, how you came about working over there. Yeah, great. So yeah, my name is Kirsten. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I have been working with the Crisis Center for the last two years. I started working there after I finished my internship with the Crisis Center, um, and we've been around since 1970. We started out as one single person in the basement of City <laughs> Hall answering calls for Birmingham, and look at where we are now. We stretch over five counties, and um, we're just so proud. And so um, what what uh, programs do you provide over at the crisis center and um, how many like how long have you worked uh, over there for? Yeah, so I've been there for two years um, and I have I started out as a, a, a bachelor's in social work intern. And so once I graduated, they brought me on full time um, to initially be a, a suicide prevention um, presenter. So I would go into schools and I would talk to kids and explain to them uh, about suicide and how to spot those signs of suicide so that way they can reach out to an adult and get them get their peers help. What do you feel is the importance of mental health and in that same light spreading awareness about good mental health? Okay yeah so mental health is really stigmatized. Um, we're still dealing with that, and even when I see it with students, young people, um, they are still really nervous about talking about it because when we talk about suicide, it's very taboo. It's a bad thing, uh, but what people don't know is that suicide has been going on for years and years and years, mm -hmm. and only recently have we decided that this was a, a bad thing, and so what the way we really need to look at it is that they're experiencing something that is going on and we need to get them help. So if we are not actively working on creating a safe space around us, and what that means is we're not saying things like, well, they're just looking for attention or mm. well, they're talking about it. So that means they will never do it. That is not true. Or telling kids, well, they don't have any reason to be depressed, right? Those things are not helpful and are certainly untrue. Um, so we really have to be open and talking about our mental illness, talking about our mental health, actively working on it, and um, really, you know, making sure that people know that you can come and talk to me if you are having a hard time because you deserve help, right? You deserve somebody to be kind to you. You deserve right. to feel safe. And so I think we have to remember empathy. I think a lot of us have kind of forgotten that and just remember mm -hmm. that some things are just hard and just because you are good at bouncing back doesn't mean that everybody else is. How has COVID, you know, because we're kind of in this limbo of COVID, so I hate to say that COVID is over because it's, yeah. it's really not, um, <laughs> but in particular, you know, how did COVID last year when everything shut down and everything really affect the services and your operations over at the crisis center? Yeah, so COVID hit us hard. It really did. And not in the sense that we had to shut things down, but more in the sense that we really had to step up and we had to no longer we could let volunteers into the crisis center. So all of us were uh, the ones who were um, answering the calls and providing those resources for people who needed those. And it was a lot. It was a lot. You know, your mental health is precious and um, it's a lot to be the support for our entire community as crisis hits. You know, that was probably for a lot of people the first time they've ever experienced a crisis, losing your job without warning. Right. It was like right. overnight everything changed. Um, so, yeah, our call volume uh, doubled in that time period. And are you still seeing that now, um, you know, with people just dealing with, um, you know, just still kind of being in it in the aftermath of like losing their job or, you know, re-entering back into their jobs? Are you seeing a lot of more calls right now and a need for services? 
Yeah, I would say it's been pretty steady since uh, COVID did ha uh, hit Birmingham. Um, yeah, people are still reeling from everything that happened and everything else that happened with like Black Lives Matter and mm -hmm. um, those things on top mm -hmm. of COVID. And so now um, studies are starting to come out that talk about the correlation between COVID and suicide. Um, mm -hmm. And then they're seeing, you know, we're starting those residual effects. So yeah, so more people are experiencing mental illness, they're experiencing depression, they're experiencing burnout, compassion fatigue, all of those things. And it's really kind of hitting people hard now. I guess before COVID and, and, and even now, like, do y'all do uh, much outreach to get uh, the word out about your services? And if so, like, where is it usually online? Or do yeah. you go to different um, organizations and, and talk about it? Yeah, so um, we have several different programs with the Crisis Center. And so, um, yeah, we all do a lot of outreach and reaching out to different agencies in the community, uh, partnering with them, but also just letting the community know that we're here. Uh, we've mm -hmm. been here for, you know, over 50 years now, and a lot of people are still unsure about the Crisis Center and what we do. So one of, of course, the first things that most people know us for are our crisis and suicide hotlines. So we administer uh, two lines. We have our own crisis line, which is local, and then we also administer the National Suicide Prevention Line. And so people call in, and a suicide crisis line is not just for somebody who is suicidal. It could be for somebody who's had a really hard day. It could be for somebody who, you know, wants to share good news with somebody who's gonna, mm -hmm. you know, who's gonna be a safe place and yeah. is gonna make them feel good about it. And of course, we're always there for anybody who's experiencing any type of thoughts of death and dying because it is really scary. And there are so many people that call and so many people that realize that, you know, they're not alone. Um, so yeah, so that's one of our biggest things. We also have Rape Response. So Rape Response is a program that is for survivors of sexual violence. Mm -hmm. And so we have a very cozy, comfy, safe place for survivors after an assault. So um, they can call us or uh, somebody can call on their behalf, whether they go to um, a police officer or a friend or something like that. And so we ask them to come in if the assault's been happened within 72 hours. So if they want to do a kit, they can. If they don't, that is also okay. They can still come in and they can receive a counseling. Um, and we also offer free counseling to survivors of sexual mm -hmm. violence. So that's another really great program. And we have great yeah. counselors who are super empowering and loving and caring. We have You Talk, which is um, a line specifically dedicated to teens and kids. So it's open from 3 p.m. to 10 p.m. And if they don't feel comfortable calling, they can also text us, which is great. Oh, wow. Uh, so yeah, so that's something really big too uh, that we have to discuss is our youth. Youth are the uh, ages 10 to 34 have the there's uh, suicide is the second leading cause of death for them so it's really important that we are tackling youth that we are talking about to our kids about mental health and self-care and um, making sure that they know that they have a place to go to and that they're not going to get in trouble it's unbelievable how many kids think that they're going to get in trouble for thinking about suicide or having mm. thoughts of death and dying. We also have uh, the senior talk lines. So that stretches over six counties, uh, Jefferson, Shelby, Chilton, Blunt, and St. Clair. And so we call uh, out to seniors to check in on them and see how they're doing because loneliness is real. Let me tell yes. you, <laughs> I think a lot of us have experienced that in the last year, um, you know, for the first time, not being able to go and see our friends, our family, the people we care about. But seniors have been dealing with this for a long time. So we, we like to reach out to our seniors and check in with them and then, you know, see how they're doing and have some conversation and, you know, have a, a good talk. And then we also have the Recovery Resource Center, which is um, information and resources for those who are dealing with a substance misuse disorder. 
That's amazing. Like, yeah, I mean, like most people, I, mm -hmm. um, I only thought that, you know, maybe the crisis center was a, a line you called, you know, if you were suicidal, mm -hmm. but I didn't know all these amazing services that you provide. And so is, yeah. it, is it in one location and can people come and visit? Like, I know they can come visit if they, you know, are a victim of sexual assault, which is great that for people to know mm -hmm. that they have a safe space to go to. I think that that's very important. Um, but do you ever get um, anybody coming in with, you know, thoughts of suicide or even, you know, like you said, people who like to come and share good news? Yeah, so we don't, um, we don't have people that come to the crisis center just because we like to keep privacy, right? That's really something okay, yeah. that's super important, confidentiality. Uh, so, so yeah, so they don't, but, you know, we do have volunteers that come and we do training on site. Um, and so, yeah, so we do have a mobile crisis unit for the, for rape response who can, who will go out. Uh, they started that back up because our whole team is vaccinated and so <laughs> it's safe and um, so yeah so they can take it out to rural areas if a survivor needs uh, assistance and they can't come to us so yeah so but we do provide um, resources if they need that if they do want that one-on-one -on -one counseling um, because a lot of people think that crisis work is the same as um, therapy and it's very different they're they're mm -hmm. two very different things and so mm -hmm. what we provide is a safe space in that moment to help you know relax a little bit and come up with some good coping skills and good self-care and you know just to be a place to vent and just be angry or be sad and not feel like you're going to get judged you know, but of course, like I said, if they want uh, that one on one, we can certainly find them resources to get that. How did your choice in becoming a mental health educator um, align with you, like your support of community and how how is important supporting community, even though that seems like kind of a given question, but how mm -hmm. did you become um, a mental health professional? So to be honest, I had no intention of getting into crisis work. I, when I started uh, at UAB, go Blazers, um, I wanted to be a teacher. And because I started school later in life, I started to realize that uh, that was not something that would make me happy because there was just a lot of work involved. And so I had a friend who told me about social work and um, then I got placed at the crisis center and I fell in love with it. I loved talking to people on the, on the line. I feel like I'm really good at connecting with people and empathizing with them. And that just kind of developed into a passion. So after that, I was hooked. I was just like, okay. And I started reading more and more about suicide and suicidality and the impact that it has and what really makes people feel closer to you so that we, you can grab onto them and pull them a, mm -hmm. at least a little bit out of the darkness, right? Yeah. To see that there is light. People don't realize that there are so many people hurting. Um, and I say that in the sense that even the people who are calling don't necessarily realize that there are so many people hurting. And if you have a whole entire community hurting, it's really hard to get anything done. Mm -hmm. um, so a big thing is a uh, housing first initiative, which essentially says that someone who is experiencing homelessness and also a substance misuse disorder, it's kind of hard to expect for them to let go of that substance misuse disorder when they don't have a safe place to lay their head every night. And the same thing goes with mental health, right? If somebody breaks their leg, like on a sporting team, like basketball, they're not expected to continue playing. They get to go home right. and rest and rehab their, their leg until they are able to come back. But if somebody attempts suicide, we expect them to get over it, come back to work and keep it moving. And that is just not, you can't do that. Yeah. Right? Especially right now. And so I really believe that if we have at least one safe space for somebody to come and say, I am not feeling good, right? Like people really just are judging me because I'm, I feel like I'm going to hurt myself because I lost my partner. Mm -hmm. And 
So we are here to really make sure that there is a safe space for people, for anyone who, you know, doesn't feel like maybe they're a part of the community, right? Or maybe feels like an outcast. Um, and I really think that if we provide that safe space, then you're able to give people a place to rest so that way they can get back to their life, right? And do the things that they, they used to love. What are the things that bring you joy in life? And how are you making time for them, especially uh, this past year where everything's kind of crazy? Yeah, so, you know, I really took the opportunity uh, from COVID to try new things and have more time to relax because that is something that I have learned that I am not good at, active mental <laughs> relaxation. And so, yeah, I've been gardening. Um, that's really fun. I also love to play The Sims. Uh, so I do that a lot. And then I also have a new puppy. So <gasps> she has taken up a lot of my time. <laughs> and uh, to make sure that I have time to do all of that, I really do focus on active mental relaxation, which is, you know, when you're sitting down watching TV and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to watch this show and it's going to be so good. And then ha like five minutes in, you're like, well, the kitchen's right there. I could put the dishes away while I'm watching TV. And then I get two things done at once. That's not active mental relaxation because then you're telling yourself, no, sit down, Kirsten, make sure you watch this TV, right? And relax. And then five minutes later, you're like, well, it won't take that long. That, you know, we deserve self-care. We deserve time to relax. So I try to make sure that I give myself that space to do that and say, it's okay. You know, it's okay to just sit here and chill out. So yeah. do you have any mental, like, uh exercises that you do to keep yourself like just to sit on the couch and to relax you know yes yes so I often will roll my shoulders back that's a big <laughs> one that I do and I make sure my jaw isn't locked and I also set up a space like on the couch when I'm ready to chill and not doing anything so I usually will bring like a tray and I put like snacks on there so I don't have to get up and I bring my blanket to the couch and I make sure the remote's close and so it's just like a whole experience right mm -hmm. so I'm just making sure that I don't have a reason to get up and also I check myself right you have to be able to check in and check yourself when you need to and say Kirsten you're not doing the dishes you're gonna sit here and relax because you have earned it and it you have earned it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm sure like, I, you know, I'm not sure, you know, if our viewers um, are curious, but I'm definitely curious. What, um, what are you planting? And I need to know the breed of your dog and what yes. their name is. And oh, how I will are. show her to you. I can bring her <gasps> and okay, show her. Okay. <laughs> Let me go get her. This is Daisy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> she's eight months and she's a chewini oh my gosh hi daisy she's a sweet girl she said oh my gosh i heard somebody somewhere call my name yeah hi daisy oh hi daisy <laughs> <laughs> she's a big part of my self-care for sure she's oh a yeah yeah, pets are so important. They really, um, they give you something to do, a purpose, set a schedule. So, you know, even if it's like a fish, honestly. Oh, absolutely. Like, yeah, yeah, we have a fish too. Yeah, yeah a fish yeah. and we so have a dog. Mm -hmm. And they're just, yep. any anything that you can, you know, take care of. They're so sweet. Yeah, it really <laughs> allows you to like just love on something and care for something. And, you know, so I think animals and pets are a great support system and I think that a lot of people forget about that mm -hmm. that pets can also be a part of your support system absolutely uh, yeah your friends uh your co-workers anybody that you allow into your safe space yeah so what are your favorite books and um do you have a favorite author or authors um or what are your favorite films that um have inspired uh your life's work or just you as a person and um what are you getting into these days yeah, so uh, uh, the type of books that I read are kind of boring books. <laughs> I like not possible books. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So I, I do read a lot about like mental health and suicide alley. So one of my favorite books that I always recommend to people is uh, Night Falls Fast and it's understanding mm -hmm. suicide and it really goes into the history of suicide and um, 
the very beginning, right? And so, and it really talks in depth about like what suicide really looks like and who it's actually impacting, right? Like most people don't know that um, suicide has a high impact on queer youth and people who are mm -hmm. indigenous. So, you know, we really, you know, it's just like things that really breaks those uh, stereotypes. So I really like that. And of course, who doesn't love true crime? <laughs> Love I mean that. the best. <laughs> I mean, it's so good. Uh, any a good murder, you know, a uh, good. Uh, what's the one we just watched? Uh, so the social dilemma. That's not a true crime, but that one's really good too. So, uh, and anything David Attenborough. What advice do you have for viewers who are personally or have loved ones who are, uh, you know, struggling with their mental health? Um, do you have any advice for like small steps or coping skills or any kind of mental exercises? Yeah, so first I wanna say that if you yourself are having thoughts of suicide or death and dying, um, I want to remind you that you deserve to have a safe place to vent. And so if you are nervous about calling us, that's okay. A lot of people are, I hear a lot of, this is my first time calling, I don't know what to expect. And what you can expect is somebody on the other side who just wants to listen. Um, we are literally waiting for people to call. In between calls, we're watching Netflix or you know, petting our dog or whatever. So we are there for our community. Um, the next thing I will say is that just check in with yourself and give yourself a break. It has been a really, really tough year. Mm -hmm. It's been unbelievably, unbelievably hard. Um, so it's okay to feel your feelings. It's okay to feel sad or angry. Um, and then also I wanna say to those people who are concerned about a loved one or a friend, um, I just wanna say, remember that it is really hard to um, ask the question, are you thinking of suicide, right? It's very scary. Um, but it is very empathetic because you are bringing up the word suicide, which is scary. A lot of people don't like that word. Um, and so you are creating the safe space when you do that. So please, please remember, if there's only one thing that you remember from this is that if you have any feeling at all that someone is having thoughts of suicide, ask the question, are you thinking of suicide? It is okay to talk about suicide because when we do that, we are allowing other people to talk about what it is that they are going through. Um, and then some uh, coping skills, some of my favorite coping skills are counting backwards from 100. Um, I also, uh, you can do the five senses skill, which is, you think about five things that you can see, four things that you hear, and so on and so forth. And um, another one that I also like to do is to pick a subject like fruit and then go through the alphabet and think about a fruit that starts with that letter, right? I promise you, you won't get to the <laughs> end, but uh, by the end of it, by the time you are done, you, will, you can start to feel yourself coming back and that's really what it is. And of course, please reach out to someone, even if it's not us at the crisis center, a friend, um, someone, you know, at your school, a school counselor, someone at work, someone that you know is a safe place. Make sure you're reaching out to them and make sure, you know, you're saying like, I'm not feeling good. Absolutely. And um, how can, um, how can viewers find you and the crisis center um, and you know the website but also like how can they find ways um, to volunteer or to um, you know participate somehow and ways to donate yeah so <clears throat> First, of course, our website is crisiscenterbham.org and you can find all the volunteer opportunities there. We um, take volunteers for the crisis line. We train you completely. We make sure that you are prepared and we always have somebody there to help you on the crisis line. And also, we're always looking for advocates and advocates are the person that we partner with survivors during um, 
their uh, experience with the crisis center if they come there. And so that way they have somebody there who can advocate for them and be there for them and say, no, they don't want to keep doing this. Um, so, you know, so we're always looking for those volunteers. And of course, right now, if you would like to donate, uh, we are a nonprofit. We are currently running the Friends Campaign. You can check that out on our website too. Uh, you can always donate under my name because of course it's a competition and who doesn't like a competition? <laughs> Kirsten loves being competitive. So <laughs> help me win, please. <laughs> and then um, lastly, uh, I do do a uh, monthly training on suicide prevention and I would love for y'all to come and join me. I make learning fun. Um, it's not a uh, drab you know so we do try to make sure that you are enjoying it while you're there but you are going to leave with a lot of good information well kirsten it has been uh an absolute pleasure um i personally have learned so much and i feel that you know our viewers uh, will also enjoy this program and um, thank you so much for your time and all the work that you're doing at the crisis center Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Thank you for agreeing to be a part of this. I hope you have a wonderful day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.